Okay, so uh, welcome everyone to the morning section. And this is the second lecture by Xi-Yin, and he will continue telling us about 2D string theory, please. Uh, okay, um, so uh, in the second lecture, I will discuss um, the dual um, matrix quantum mechanics uh, to sequence one string theory, the 2D string theory we talked about last time. Um, so um, I'm gonna start by just defining the matrix model. They are uh, a couple of different ways to motivate uh, the dual matrix quantum mechanics, neither of which can be view, really viewed in my opinion as a derivation. Um, so in fact, uh, I'm not aware of a really you know, physically robust argument why this matrix model is due to, to sequel one string theory. I'm just gonna first discuss the model, define what it is, discuss its properties, and then we can discuss to what extent we can understand this duality and, and why the duality should hold. Okay, so um, uh, the theory we're gonna, we're gonna discuss is a, um, um, I, can, I can call it a UN uh, gauged uh, matrix quantum mechanics. Um, so um, now normally, uh, you know, in quantum mechanical theory, we don't always talk about uh, the gauge quantum mechanics, so I'm, I have to define what that means. Um, now, uh, if you were to formulate a theory using a Lagrangian, it's just like a zero plus one dimensional gauge theory. But for the purpose of this discussion, it's going to be a bit more convenient to use the standard Hamiltonian formulation for the quantum mechanics. So I'm going to work with Hamiltonian and wave functions. Um, so in that context, if I say a symmetry is gauged, all that means is that wave function, of course, the Hamiltonian has to be invariant under symmetry for that symmetry to be um, you know, for the gauge symmetry to be possibly a symmetry, but to say that it's gauged, uh, well, that means that the wave function is, is invariant with back to, in this case, a UN symmetry. Um, okay, so uh, the canonical variables, uh, variables are uh, X, uh, which are N by N um, uh, Hermitian matrices. Hermitian uh, matrices. So uh, UN, uh, acts by uh, um, adjoint transformation on X, adjoint action on X, where this omega is a N by N unitary matrix. Okay, and uh, the wave function uh, is gonna be just the function of uh, X um, is required, required by definition uh, to be uh, UN invariant. So in other words, I can say that uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the Hilbert space uh, is spanned by uh, wave functions that are, say, L2 functions are uh, R to the N squared, that's the number of real degrees of freedom, restricted to the UN invariant sector, UN invariant subspace, okay? Um, all right, so um, uh, now I have to write on Hamiltonian. So uh, the conjugate, conjugate momentum canonical momentum to these uh, canonical variables, the momentum I'm gonna call the PIJ, the also matrices so XIJ here is, I'm gonna label the entries of X as XIJ. Um, so PIJ, these are conjugate variables, these are minus I partial by partial XJI. Um, and uh, so I'm gonna write the P for the, for the MIA matrix and the Hamiltonian uh, is gonna be of the form, uh, gonna be non relativistic single trace expression, trace of P squares, over two, just as a convention, plus some potential of X, which we'll discuss uh, momentarily. Okay, so that's the basic model, uh, but this is not, uh, you know, uh, going to be the, the theory that's strictly speaking dual to sequence one string theory. Uh, the one that's going to be dual to sequence one string theory, as we'll discuss, um, is going to be a specific double scaling limit where you have to take the potential V to be some specific form and then, then take the strict angle to infinity limit. So, uh, will be be interested uh, in a double scaling limit uh, in which n will be sent to infinity and uh, uh, the potential uh, will take go to a specific form uh, which just looks like uh, minus x squared over two. Um, now, if you just take the potential to be minus x squared over two, I do mean it with a minus sign. Uh, it's not bounded from below, so it looks like this. Uh, if I just draw, plot V of X, uh, you know, um, 
this inverted harmonic potential. Um, so um, if I just uh, write this Hamiltonian, obviously, you know, the energy is not bounding from below. Um, and, uh, you know, it makes sense as a quantum mechanical system, but uh, it would not have a ground state. Um, so um, uh, it will turn out uh, to define the, the model of interest. Uh, you can always imagine that we'll, we can regularize this potential by, uh, you, you know, uh, choosing it to so maybe look like this uh, at large x. Uh, the details of that will not matter in the limit of interest. Um, in the limit of interest, um, we're going to, um, so in order to explain the limit of interest, uh, I have to discuss a few pre pre preliminaries. Um, the first point is that uh, it will turn out that um, this matrix quantum mechanics is equivalent to a system of non-interacting fermions. Um, and um, the reason for that will be explained uh, momentarily. Um, so these fermions will fill up um, sort of Fermi levels, energy levels, and because of Pauli exclusion, um, um, they will occupy all the energy levels up to some uh, Fermi energy. Uh, let's say this, uh, if I take um, the top of the potential to be in zero, as it is written here, um, uh, the Fermi energy will be taken to be, let's say, minus mu. So this, this gap will be mu. Um, so we're going to consider uh, a, uh, the, the ground state of the system will be described by the fermions filling this Fermi C um, up to energy minus mu. And the limit of, gonna, uh, of interest to me is n goes to infinity uh, with mu fixed. So for this purpose, this, these, uh, you know, the part of the potential I, I have to you know, uh, define in order to regularize the system, in order to uh, make it bounded, uh, this uh, right part of the potential will be pushed, pu pushed off to infinity. And uh, at the end of the day, uh, in fact, only this uh, minus x squared over two part of the potential is relevant for the discussion. So okay. how many kinds of formulas do we have? Just, uh, just, one, end or just one type, one? just, just one. one type. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna derive that uh, uh, right now. Okay, so, so here I sketched the picture uh, but in order to make sense of this, I have to say where the free, you know where the free fermions come from. Um, all right. So so now let, let's let, let me explain that. Um, to, 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 to see if the system is equivalent to that of free fermions, I will do a uh, gauge fixing essentially. Uh, so in, in the context of the in the case of the uh, well in the framework of the Hamiltonian formalism, um, gauge fixing just means that I'm going to uh, utilize the UN symmetry to um, write this uh, canonical coordinate, the matrix X in a specific form. I can use UN symmetry to write it as omega inverse on the omega. I can always do this where omega is a uh, UN value matrix and lambda is a diagonal matrix. Lambda one through to the top, lambda n. I can always choose to diagonalize X in this way. Um, now, um, this way of writing X in terms of uh, lambda and omega, uh, this is not unique. There's uh, uh, in other words, there's, uh, if, I, if I view this diagonalization procedure as uh, some kind of gauge fixing, there's a residual uh, gauge symmetry. Um, if I, so you know, uh, the, the wave function uh, psi of x can be redefined as a function of um, lambda and omega. Um, the residual gauge symmetry is going to act, uh, well, so what are the re residual gauge symmetries? So first of all, um, there's a U1 to the N uh, because if, suppose I have chosen X to be in this way, if I multiply omega on the left by a diagonal matrix, unitary, all the entries are phases, um, then it preserves, uh, preserves uh, the X. So, so this is just multiplying omega on the left by a matrix, we call it T of the form E to the I alpha one, da, da, da to the i alpha n for some phases. Um, there's also a, another, as a semi-derived product of this with the uh, SN, the permutation symmetry, this um, permutes um, the, uh, the lambda i's. Uh, so explicitly you can see this uh, by the following. So um, <clears throat> if you send lambda to wij inverse lambda wij, where wij is a unitary matrix, it looks like 
uh, this. Um, I guess uh, there'll be some i jth entry i and jth entry to the so zero one uh, one zero. All the other the, all the remaining entries are zero. Um, um, this is unitary matrix, and uh, you know if you act lambda by conjugation, it permutes swap i and jth eigenvalues, um, and if, if you do at the same time send omega to uh, wij inverse omega, then you see that this x is still left invariant. So that's another re res residual uh, symmetry uh, if you choose this parameterization. Now, um, we uh, demand that uh, psi is uh, un invariant um, since the model by definition is going to be gauge or equivalently, this is called uh, sometimes called the singlet sector. Um, later, we're going to extend beyond this, but so far, this is the model of, of interest. Uh, that means uh, if you write this as a wave function in as, as a function of lambda and omega, then um, then this omega dependence actually drops out. Okay, um, so now um, uh, in a sense, we can uh, write a wave function uh, as a function of uh, just this diagonal, um, the eigenvalues of the matrix X. Um, uh, okay, so, so this is a function of uh, lambda one through uh, lambda n. And um, now because of this residual SN uh, permutation symmetry, uh, this wave function psi of lambda uh, by construction uh, is uh, symmetric, symmetric um, in lambda one through lambda n. So in the sense, we have n bosons, non-relativistic bosons moving one dimension. Okay. Any questions so far? So now I've showed that the matrix model is equivalent to theory of bosons. That by itself doesn't mean too much. This is just gauge fixing, nothing more than that. Um, but the important thing is to understand what the dynamics looks like. Um, so we have to write the Hamiltonian um, as a, a differential operator, not just acting on functions of x, but acting on functions of lambda and omega. So now the omega will drop out. Um, but for the purpose of the discussion, it's actually useful to keep track of the omega dependence uh, because we're going to later extend this model uh, in the fourth lecture. Anyway. So uh, for now, uh, let's see. So partial my partial xij, this differential operator, which appears in the Hamiltonian via the momentum, um, it's a straightforward exercise of calculus to show that you can rewrite this as a differential operator um, in lambda and omega. Um, I'll just write down the answer, sum over k, omega ki, omega inverse, jk, partial by partial lambda k, plus uh, sum over k, not equal to l, Omega ki, omega inverse jl, um, some object I'll call r lk over lambda k minus lambda l, uh, where r ij is defined to be uh, the un rotation uh, omega. So this is the um, uh, this is the sort of the un rotation um, functions of omega. So Rij in particular obey a commutation relation of the UND algebra. Uh, so using this formula, it's straightforward just plug in this into Hamiltonian. It's straightforward to uh, so uh, in terms of Hamiltonian in terms of um, partial with back to lambda i and this Rij, uh, we can write the Hamiltonian as. Um, so this is a straightforward exercise. So I'll just write down the answer. It looks like sum over i. Um, there's some cellular derivative in the eigenvalues plus the same potential. Um, and uh, then there's some uh, stuff that uh, involve uh, some over a pair of eigenvalues. One over, uh, I'm gonna write uh, you know, lambda ij to be uh, lambda i minus lambda j. So this will be one over lambda ij partial by partial lambda i uh, plus rij rji over lambda ij squared. Okay, so um, if you take the Hamiltonian to act on a wave function that's un invariant, um, this last term uh, will drop out. So we ignore that term for now, you'll become important in the fourth lecture. Um, so look at the system, uh, you see that uh, now even though the 
you know, the wave function is that of n uh, bosons. They are the bosons are interacting with one another through this this term over here, right? Um, but uh, it turns out that uh, it's a simple observation that it's possible to uh, perform a similarity transformation on Hamiltonian H and write it as delta inverse H prime delta, where delta is the van der Mond determinant. So this is product I less than J, and I J. Um, and uh, now H prime simplifies slightly. H prime can be written as sum over I, uh, the same as the first line. Uh, but then the only other term is this Rij, Rji term, which again, as I mentioned earlier, um, this last term drops out uh, if you act this on UN invariant wave function. So now we're just left with the first term and clearly this is a decouple system. So now we have N not interacting uh, non relativistic particles uh, and, uh, uh, but uh, you know, this H prime is not a operator that's supposed to act on uh, the original wave function. Uh, rather, uh, we should, you know, if you want to view H prime as a Hamiltonian, um, then uh, the wave function acts on is not psi, but psi prime related by psi is this delta in inverse psi prime. So psi prime is the wave function on which H prime acts. So in other words, if you want to interpret the system as N free particles, these wave functions part N particles are not psi, but psi prime. Now, because delta, this van der Mond determinant, as I defined here, is completely anti-symmetric in the lambda ice, uh, and psi is completely symmetric, and therefore psi prime is anti-symmetric. So this is completely anti-symmetric uh, with respect to the SN permutation. So now we have, instead of n bosons, n fermions. And they are non-interacting uh, due to this uh, decoupling. Any questions about this? So uh, I'll again emphasize that in the fourth lecture, we're going to generalize, generalize the system to a situation where wave function is not quite UN invariant. Um, and this last term here is going to lead to interaction among the fermions. But for now, we're going to consider this uh, singular sector of the theory completely gauged. Um, and, and is equivalent to a system of N free fermions. Ashi? Yeah. Uh, what, what is a partial L in the definition of uh, ROIJ? Did I write partial L? I didn't write part. Oh, yeah. maybe the, my handwriting here is not very clear. That's omega. Oh, omega. Uh -huh. Okay. As I said, it's the UN generator icon omega. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Um, okay, so uh, now uh, you might think this model then is uh, rather trivial. In some sense, it is. You can solve, uh, compute anything you want because the system of uh, is equivalent to you know uh, free fermions, and uh, you know in the um, the one the one-dimensional Schrodinger problem for the fermion is not very complicated. Um, but uh, um, you know, uh, if I claim that theory is somehow dual to uh, the string theory. Um, uh, the strings are, by definition, interacting in this perturbative formalism. In fact, last time I explained how to compute the perturbative amplitudes. Um, so, uh, so the strings, the, the point of the strings are not dual, not supposed to be dual to the fermions. Um, rather, they're supposed to be dual to uh, collective excitations of the ground state. Uh, so now I'm going to uh, explain um, what are the collective, what what are the low energy excitations uh, of the ground state of this of this um, matrix quantum mechanics. Uh, system um, and uh, how to understand the scattering process uh, from this. You know, what, 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 is the, what is the scattering problem of interest uh, and what are the relevant uh, degrees of freedom? Okay, um, so um, uh, first we'll describe this as a semi classical level. Um, so I'm going to describe this Fermi C, which is the, the ground state of the system. Uh, well, in fact, we can uh, also this. So the ground state is going to be some kind of Fermi C, but we can also describe the some certain kind of semi-classical low energy excitations as deformations of the Fermi C. 
So in semi-classic quantization, we can think of, uh, so we have n eigenvalues, that are fermions. Um, for each eigenvalue, the phase space is parameterized by uh, lambda and conjugate momentum, p lambda. Um, and uh, for now, uh, let's say we're gonna take the Hamiltonian um, for the each individual eigenvalue to be uh, p squared over two plus the potential, which will take it to be minus lambda squared over two. Now, as I, as I mentioned earlier, um, to make the system well-defined at finite n with the well-defined ground states, you need to uh, modify the potential to make it bounded. Um, but uh, you know, uh, for now, this uh, uh, issue will not be so important. Um, you can always imagine adding some uh, you know, alpha lambda fourth term or lambda and then take lambda, take alpha to zero uh, at the end. Um, okay, so um, with this, uh, and, and as I said before, we like to consider um, uh, the value of n to be such that uh, the uh, Fermi energy, the maximal energy of the fermions uh, is minus mu for some uh, fixed quantity mu. Um, so, um, you know, the equipotential or equipotential surface uh, looks like this hyperboloid, like so. Um, now, if you, if you add this, uh, this alpha term is going to kind of close it up like that at large dis distance. And, and, um, um, and this fermions will fill, fill up the allowed region uh, of the phase space um, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, occupying um, uh, with, with one fermion occupying every uh, unit area of uh, 2 pi h bar. Okay. Uh, that's that's the usual quantization uh, procedure uh, at the semi-classical level. Um, okay, uh, so now uh, I would like to. Uh, okay, well, actually, maybe let me just write this down. Uh, so we're gonna uh, fill up to this is where uh, p squared minus lambda squared over two is equal to uh, minus mu. Um, this is a hyperboloid and. Uh, um, we're going to discuss excitations on top of this. Uh, so for this purpose, it's useful to uh, parameterize uh, lambda as uh, uh, square root of two mu cosh of tau. Um, so so here, this uh, this um, hyperboloid, uh, let's call this the top part to be p plus of lambda, the bottom function could be p minus of lambda, then the p plus minus uh, of, of lambda is equal to plus minus square root of two mu. Uh, cinch of tau. So the tau here, tau is a, is a spatial coordinate, is a, is a new new spatial coordinate. Okay, um, and um, uh, mm, let's see. Um, Okay, so, so now I'm going to discuss uh, the fluctuations of, uh, uh, of the Fermi C. Um, so in the space space, each fermion uh, moves along a trajectory uh, that, that looks like, say this. Um, so if you deform uh, the state of the system, but still in a semi-classical regime, that correspond to kind of creating a, a, some kind of ripple on the, uh, on the Fermi surface of the shape of this function, say p minus of lambda, and this ripple is going to propagate along, uh, you know, and eventually turn to some ripple that goes out. Um, so these ripples are going to, rather than the Fermi themselves, are going to be the actual low energy excitations of the system, um, and we'll see that in fact, even though the fermions are free, these ripples will be effectively interacting, and it's these ripples that are going to be dual to the string of the two D string theory. Okay, so um, in order to uh, describe the, you know, the dynamics of these ripples, we would like to write down some kind of either Hamiltonian or Lagrangian uh, for the ripples as a field theory. So this is also called so, collective field theory. Uh, yes. so, uh, so, so what's the dual of the free fermion itself? Uh, the well, 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 we'll discuss that uh, later. Uh, okay. right. um, 
Okay, so let's first discuss the more elementary objects. So from, from the point of view of excitational fermions, you know, the fermions are not the fundamental objects. The fundamental objects that carry the low energy excitations are these ripples. Um, all right, well, maybe fundamental is not the right word, but anyway, low energy excitations. Um, okay, so in order to describe um, these ripples, I'm going to uh, uh, just parameterize the system using uh, you know, this P plus lambda and P minus lambda, which are no longer uh, no longer these functions, but more general functions, you know, would be allowed. Um, now, uh, the eigenvalue density, so the lambda, remember, these are eigenvalues. The eigenvalue density uh, is defined to be, uh, I'll call it rho of lambda, it's just sum over uh, delta functions, delta lambda minus lambda i. Um, now, in the Semi-classical approximation. Uh, I'm working in h bar equals one units, of, as always. Um, as I said, um, there's going to be uh, so per area two pi in the phase space. There's going to be one uh, one fermion. So eigenvalue density here is basically the. Um, let me draw a picture. Uh, uh, so if you look at the position over here. Uh, in some interval between maybe say uh, lambda and lambda plus d lambda, um, the eigenvalue density is the number of uh, fermions in this strip divided by two pi. Okay, so so in other words, um, this rho is uh, one over two pi of uh, p plus of lambda uh, minus p minus of lambda. Okay. Um, and um, of course, uh, the ground state uh, eigenvalue density is just uh, uh, what we already wrote, um, 1 over pi. I uh, can write this as square root of um, the square minus 2 mu, which is the hyperboloid configuration. OK, uh, so but now the subject of interest is fluctuations. So we're going to expand uh, this density profile uh, as a rho node of lambda, the ground state configuration, plus fluctuation field. Um, for reasons that become uh, clear uh, momentarily, I'm going to parameterize the fluctuation field in a funny way. I'm going to call it 1 over square pi partial lambda of eta of lambda. And this eta of lambda is going to be uh, the, I call the collective field, um, which is going to be the canonical variable of uh, my new uh, collective field theory, Lagrangian system. Um, OK. So uh, the key point, the key step now uh, to write the Lagrangian on the Hamiltonian, um, well, you know, uh, it's easier to start with the Hamiltonian because we know uh, that here we're drawing the phase space. So the Hamiltonian system is just the sum of all the energy of the fermions. So we just need to integrate over, over the Fermi C with this profile, we get the Hamiltonian. That's very easy. Um, the slightly trickier thing here is that, um, you know, to form the Hamiltonian system, it's not enough to say what the Hamiltonian is. You also have to say what are the canonical momenta are. So far, we've described what are the um, canonical, what we have chosen to uh, use the eta, these fields, to be the new canonical coordinates of our new field theory. Um, but what are the momenta? You have to study uh, the classical Poisson bracket in order to figure out what the momenta is. And uh, uh, so it turns out, um, let me first tell you the answer and, and then explain why that this is co correct. So the conjugate uh, momentum density, so this is the canonical momentum density, um, I'm going to call it pi of lambda, um, is uh, equal to uh, minus 1 over 2 square root pi, uh, p plus of lambda plus p minus lambda. Okay, so this is the answer. It's not obvious why this is true. Earlier, remember, this rho was uh, uh, p plus minus p minus here this pi is p plus plus p minus but is not conjugate to rho it's conjugate to uh, this eta or rho is related to partial of eta okay so why is this true um i'm gonna i think it's important to kind of kind of explain how, how, the, how this how the logic works um so i'm gonna go through this uh, elementary exercise here um so um okay um so let, let's check this um, uh, 
Now let's look at the momentum conjugated to the eigenvalue lambda i, which are the original canonical variables. I have to do some kind of change of variable. Um, so what, let's consider the momentum density. So just like the, the density of eigenvalues themselves, let's consider this quantity. Um, so this quantity uh, in a semi-classical approximation, uh, by the same logic, it's integral over the strip in the phase space from p minus to p plus uh, dp uh, times p itself. Now, without the p, it was a density. With the p, it is uh, the sort of momentum density um, of the eigenvalues. And of course, this integral uh, we can all do is 1 over 4 pi uh, p plus square of lambda minus p minus square of lambda. OK. Uh, now, let's study the Poisson bracket of rho of lambda with uh, this quantity here. Uh, let's label it by j, lambda uh, delta uh, of lambda prime minus lambda j, like so. Um, so let's study this Poisson bracket. Um, OK, so uh, remember this rho was a sum over these delta functions and uh, this commutation relation with, 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 with p uh, is the standard one. So this is just going to give you um, uh, sum over i. Uh, uh, well, let me remind you that this was sum over i delta lambda minus lambda i. So this lambda i has some non-trivial Poisson bracket with p. Right? So p acts on it by taking derivative. But I can then convert it to derivative with back to lambda and write the minus i in front, minus delta prime, lambda minus lambda i. Um, and then here I have delta of lambda prime minus lambda i. Okay, and of course this is equal to uh, minus delta prime of lambda minus lambda prime times this, the sum, which is rho of lambda prime. Okay, um, now uh, by because of this, together we remember rho was. Uh, p plus minus p minus and pi is p plus plus p minus. So uh, by that, this quantity here um, is, uh, is equal to uh, actually, uh, according to what I claimed for expression for pi, this is minus squared pi uh, rho of lambda, uh, this con capital pi of lambda. That's the thing that enters here. Um, so, and because rho is, uh, uh, involves partial lambda, it follows from this that uh, so rho is up to a factor of pi is partial lambda of eta of lambda. And here we get the rho, uh, which uh, Poisson commutes with eta. And then we're left with this pi, lambda prime. And if you factor out this rho on both sides, you just get this Poisson bracket is uh, um, uh, partial prime, lambda minus lambda prime. Okay, you can check the sign and factor pi works out. And, and therefore you restore this commutation relation, eta with pi, Poisson bracket, is the desired delta function in lambda minus lambda prime. Therefore, this pi is indeed as claimed, the canonical conjugate momentum. Okay. Any questions about this? Uh, so uh, with this understanding, everything else will just follow through. Uh, so the Hamiltonian is, as I said, the total energy integral d lambda, uh, go from p five minus to p plus dp. Uh, uh, that's the, uh, um, um, uh, well, the, the, the density of the fermions, and you just need to multiply this by square over two, lambda over square over two plus, plus mu. Um, and then uh, we can uh, simply do a, uh, it will be uh, for now in the convenient to do a change of variable into this parameter tau um, that I defined earlier, this, this tau parameter here. Um, and um, uh, you have to be a bit careful so uh, because this notion of canonical momentum depends on what coordinate system you're working. So let me call this pi lambda to emphasize that uh, this is kind of momentum density in lambda coordinate. If I change the special coordinate, I have to include a Jacobian in the momentum density. So this is the pi lambda, uh, pi lambda, and uh, this pi lambda, pi lambda here. Um, I'm uh, so it's a straightforward calculation. I'm not gonna you know do this explicitly here. Um, you can change this variable to d tau, uh, which now is going to range from zero to infinity. So, so re recall that uh, uh, by my parameterization, uh, the tip of the ground state Fermi surface is uh, this is where tau is equal to zero, and uh, 
and yeah, and, and tau increases. Um, <clears throat> okay, so um, uh, tau ranging from zero to infinity, uh, and then we've got uh, uh, so so it turns out um, that um, if, if you calculate the Hamiltonian, you'll find that it has a uh, uh, a nice form in this sort of kinetic term. So this this pi tau squared, this is this pi tau sub tau is the canonical momentum conjugate to eta field in the tau coordinate. So the Poisson bracket is delta function in tau, not in lambda. Uh, plus uh, partial tau of eta squared. Remember tau is a special coordinate, not to be confused with time here. I'm not writing any time derivative here. Um, and then uh, there's gonna be some uh, cubic term. It just come from integrating, you know, for example, you integrate this p squared, you get p cubed. So you get some cubic term. Um, and if you work it out, it turns out to be squared pi over 12 mu um, cinch tau uh, squared um, three pi squared partial tau of eta uh, plus uh, partial eta of tau, uh, uh, partial tau of eta uh, cubed. Uh, and that's it. Okay, so um, uh, so this Hamiltonian written in, in this way takes uh, the form uh, takes some, some kind of, this is exact, um, uh, but uh, it naturally separates into the standard kinetic term uh, for a field that lives on the semi-infinite real line and a cubic interaction term. Um, and one over mu is like a coupling, is uh, some kind of effective coupling. Okay, uh, now uh, this is very reasonable because um, you know, mu effectively controls uh, the overall scale of the eigenvalue density. And in the limit when the eigenvalue density goes to infinity, uh, the system becomes classical. Uh, but when the density is finite, uh, corresponding to mu finite, um, the quantum effects are what give rise to interactions. Um, I mean, you know, through the Pauli exclusion. Um, and, uh, you know, evidently, staring at this, this Hamiltonian, it looks like the theory is interacting because there's cubic coupling. And the coefficient uh, and it falls off a large tau. Tau, remember, is a spatial coordinate now. So there's some interaction that's kind of localized uh, near the, uh, the tip of this uh, hyperboloid term surface. Um, now, I should make a few comments. Uh, in fact, uh, if you look at this Hamiltonian, you might be a bit uh, skeptical because it actually looks a bit singular. It looks singular at tau equals zero. In fact, because the field is only defined on a semi-infinite real line. So uh, at um, tau equals zero, uh, looks a bit singular. Um, in fact, um, uh, needs some uh, boundary condition uh, for eta. And the boundary condition is such that you know partial tau of eta should be uh, allowed to be finite, uh, and uh, the boundary condition of choice turns out to be a Dirichlet type. So eta dot at the tau equals zero, I mean time derivative, this should be equal to zero. So some kind of Dirichlet boundary condition. Um, and um, um, uh, but you know, still, you might worry that uh, you know this uh, point tau equals zero is a bit singular, and you might have to regularize it. And it will turn out to be the case that in this formalism of this collective field theory, you do have to regularize the calculation at tau equals zero, uh, which seems to be not quite satisfactory because you might worry whether your regularization scheme is really consistent. Uh, it turns out that there's a simple regularization scheme that is consistent, and I will justify that um, later uh, by reformulating this uh, theory in a Using a different set of coordinates. Okay, but for now, uh, I would like to show you uh, a uh, simple calculation just to uh, show you that you know you can actually compute something with the, uh, with this uh, uh, with this Hamiltonian. Okay, um, so um, in order to do some calculation, let's consider uh, let's do perturbation theory. So we're going to compute the simplest non-trivial S matrix, which is uh, let's say one to two process. And in order to do this. Um, it's, uh, uh, you know, as usual, it's useful to, uh, you know, write this interaction term in momentum space. So let's consider, uh, or, so kind of in the old fashioned perturbation theory, we can uh, think of the S matrix, at least, you know, at tree level using computer S matrix using the Born approximation. 
Uh, so we're going to view the second term here, the cubic term, as uh, interaction. And we're going to expand the fields uh, in the free field mode expansion. Uh, and uh, then we calculate matrix elements of the interaction Hamiltonian uh, to obtain the tree level S matrix elements. So the, the, the simplest kind of calculation of S matrix element you can do in this theory. So the mode expansion um, of, uh, 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 of eta tau uh, looks like this. So this will be at time equals zero. I didn't even write the time coordinates. So the time will be set to zero here. Uh, eta of tau uh, is going to be of uh, the form integral dp over pi. Um, I'm going to use a standard, a slightly non-standard normalization for the creation and the Nyshan operator for these um, bosons. Um, one over p, um, b, um, uh, actually, let me call this a, uh, a, b plus uh, a, p dagger uh, sine d tau. Uh, this is because uh, um, our choice of the, uh, the Dirichlet boundary condition. In fact, the overall shift the eta by constant doesn't matter, which is why I can actually choose the eta to be uh, zero at tau equals zero. And um, um, uh, the conjugate uh, momentum, uh, um, oh, I think I, well, my note, I think this is pi lambda, uh, sorry, pi, pi tau, I think. Uh, let's see, yeah. Um, the tau um, is, can be written as i to the infinity dp over square pi uh, minus a p plus a p dagger uh, sine p tau. Uh, you can check that this is the correct small expansion provided that um, a p and uh, a p prime dagger obey a competition relation p times delta function p minus uh, p prime. So as I said, it's a slightly non-standard convention, um, but that'll do. Um, okay, so uh, in particular, uh, the thing that enters this interaction Hamiltonian is uh, uh, partial tau of eta, uh, which is uh, the dp of eta, a p plus a p dagger cosine p of tau. Okay, so uh, let's consider the one to two amplitudes. So one to two in the Born approximation. So this tree level, uh, one to two amplitude uh, is uh, just, uh, in my definition, I factor out the delta function uh, in energy, but then there's some factor of two pi that comes along with the right. Um, so it's the matrix elements of the interaction Hamiltonian between a in state, you can write in this way, and out state, b omega one, b omega two, uh, this kind of, uh, sorry, not, I switched my convention here. This, uh, this is our a, a omega. Right, um, and uh, you can just plug in and calculate. And um, uh, I think uh, uh, you know I won't do this uh, uh, algebra in its entire detail. Actually, I think I can do it uh, because uh, it's probably instructive. So let, let me just write it out. Right. I'm literally plugging this in, uh, this multi expansion into this funny looking cubic action. Right. So if you do that, find uh, minus i. It's one over mu in front integral uh, d tau over sinh tau squared. Um, and then, um, uh, you know, uh, there are, uh, so you just have to compute these commutators and the commutator always give you some factor of omega in front because that's my convention here with the p delta of p. Uh, so I get some factor of uh, uh, omega, uh, so have omega going to omega one and omega two um, so I have omega times omega one, omega two from these commutators. And then I have a bunch of sines and cosines. I have uh, sine omega one, sine omega two tau, cosine omega of tau, um, plus, uh, so there, there are various terms by expanding the uh, interaction Hamiltonian and just do the commutators. Uh, and finally, uh, so the, these three terms are from uh, you know, from, from this, this first term uh, of the cubic interaction, and then from the last term, I get uh, three cosines because so this partial eta involves a cosine here. I said um, cosine of omega one, omega, cosine omega two tau, cosine omega tau. 
Um, and uh, of course, omega is supposed to be equal to omega one plus omega two. And you can check that uh, everything in this brackets add up to one, all right? Um, and so the result is just um, minus i over mu omega omega one omega two integral um, d tau to the square tau, uh, which uh, is divergent. Uh, so we're going to, as I said, we'll have to regularize. We're going to regularize it by changing this to some cutoff delta. And then uh, this thing is going to now be equal to cos of delta uh, minus 1. And um, uh, now taking the delta goes to 0 limit, we get minus 1 plus 1 over delta. And we're going to cancel this div divergence with the, uh, some counter term. Um, they'll come with the inverse powers of this, this uh, UV cutoff delta. Um, and if you do that, uh, we're left with a finite part, which is uh, at tree level one to two amplitude, which is I over two, uh, omega, omega one, omega two. Uh, you might recall that in the last lecture, first lecture, I said the tree level three point amplitude of sequel one string theory is omega, omega one, omega two times the string coupling. Okay, so that identifies mu with the string coupling. So in fact, um, G, which is uh, one over mu, is uh, in some natural convention, two pi times string coupling. I was not very careful about the convention for the string coupling la last lecture, so I won't um, extend this two pi here. So how do I see that the previous P uh, variable is the energy omega? Uh, oh, uh, you know, uh, maybe I didn't emphasize this, but this thing obeys a, a relative, the free part is just a uh, field eta, obeys the dispersion relation of a relativistic massless particle. So P is equal to omega. I see. Right. Um, I think there's a question about what is possible to redefine the field uh, to cancel this. Uh, well, you see, uh, redefining the field is not supposed to change the S matrix, okay? That's the whole point of having S matrix as a physical observable that's independent of field redefinition. So if you do th things correctly, redefining the field better not change the calculation of S matrix. Uh, but you know, it will be understandable if you are not happy with this calculation because you have to do this funny regularization. Okay, so you might not be convinced that the result is correct. Um, I mean, I would not have been convinced if I only have seen this calculation. Um, let me now explain to you an alternative calculation. The reason I bother to explain this field calculation is because later it's going to be convenient in discussion of long string. But for now, uh, let me give you an alternative um, uh, approach, uh, also with collective field, instead of viewing lambda as spatial coordinates, I'm going to view uh, uh, p, the momentum conjugate to lambda for the eigenvalue as a spatial coordinate. Uh, or uh, rather, I will write p of lambda to be, uh, define this to be square two mu cinch of tau. Uh, strictly speaking, I should call this maybe tau tilde or something. This is not to uh, a different tau, different uh, coordinate from uh, before, okay? So before I write, so of course the, the two, these two coordinates coincide in the ground state, but they will not be coinciding when we talk about excited states, okay? Um, so uh, for this discussion, actually it is necessary to regularize the Hamiltonian. So the Hamiltonian, I'm gonna take it to be P squared minus Lambda squared over two plus some alpha lambda to fourth, uh, I'll keep alpha to be non-zero and positive and send alpha to zero uh, at the end, at the end. Um, so for finite alpha, uh, the Fermi, the ground state configuration looks like this droplet. Uh, this is in uh, phase space. Um, and if I look at, uh, so as I said, I want to you choose view P or this tau as a coordinate. So at the fixed coordinates now, um, our field, field conversion is parameterized by um, the minimal and maximal eigenvalue lambda minus and lambda plus. Okay, and by a uh, manipulation similar to the discussion before, computing this Poisson bracket, you can show that in fact lambda plus minus as function of p uh, are um, given by the ground state configuration. You have to solve this um, some quadratic equation, algebraic equation, okay, to find what lambda zero is. Uh, plus some combination of the uh, canonical momentum and the canonical coordinates eta. This is a different kind of eta now. 
but mathematically, so they're similar, but it's a, it's a different kind of field. And this pi p is again the moment the canonical momentum density conjugate to eta in the p coordinate. Um, I invite you to do this exercise. It's very instructive, um, but I won't have time to do it now. Um, you can um, get the Hamiltonian, uh, write, write Hamiltonian as a, as a function of, of uh, um, you know, of, uh, of eta and pi, uh, pi p, and uh, then turn this into Lagrangian or an action um, of, of eta. And uh, once you turn this into action, you'll turn out that uh, you can uh, safely take the alpha prime goes to zero limit, uh, and the action will remain perfectly regular, uh, and it will look like integral from minus infinity to infinity. Remember now, so so now as, as you take the limit lambda to, to zero, this, this this blob goes up to you know, becomes a hyperbola again, um, and um, but the tau is a coordinate that now runs from minus infinity to infinity. Right, this is this is the coordinate in p. So so now tau runs from minus infinity to infinity. And you have a minus eta dot partial tau eta minus partial tau eta squared plus square root pi over three mu uh, cosh square root of tau times partial tau eta cubed. Actually, it looks a little bit similar, uh, simpler than before. Um, so that's kind of interesting. You see, again, it looks like some kind of kinetic term uh, plus interaction term, which is still cubic. But now the kinetic term is looks like a relativistic Divistic uh, right moving uh, masses field. And uh, here now, this uh, looking at the interaction term, this is non no longer singular, it's non singular uh, at uh, tau equals zero. So that, that looks good. Um, and uh, you can repeat the exercise, which is actually simpler, one to amplitude, and you'll find the answer still i over mu omega, omega one, omega two. Okay, so can I obtain this answer using this formalism as well? Any questions about this? Okay. Um, so, uh, so it's nice that uh, it seems to agree already at the tree level three point amplitudes, and you can actually compute all the tree level endpoint amplitude using this formalism. Uh, it becomes a bit messy. Um, now, uh, but at least it provides you a kind of a space time picture of uh, what this field theory is. Um, but, uh, it's unclear, uh, at least uh, I don't, I'm not aware of a very clean way to, uh, you know, to uh, understand this kind of field theory uh, beyond, um, uh, beyond tree level. Uh, the re main reason is because, you know, we wrote this Hamiltonian based on a semi-classical picture of the Fermi C. And so you may not be sure, even if you try to quantize the theory, it's not clear uh, that it's actually going to agree with whatever appropriate quantum you know, excitation of the Fermi of the, of the Fermi system. Um, so, in fact, uh, but uh, you know, after all, the system is that of free fermion, so it's got to be possible to, to solve it completely. And indeed, there's a, there's an alternative way, which is um, you know, physically perhaps slightly less intuitive, uh, but gives you a nice way to write down answers to all other perturbation theory. In fact, uh, even beyond perturbation theory, as we'll see. Um, so the this alternative uh, description um, of uh, these uh, collective excitations, uh, which is through uh, by viewing the excitation as particle hole pairs. Okay, so. Uh, I mean, draw a schematic picture now in real space, and there's a potential, and there's a Fermi C over here. And uh, uh, if you want to give a low energy excitation, you cannot, you don't want to just create, you know, a fermion by itself because that thing, you know, you know, first of all, it's not even clear what what you mean by the excitation that creates extra fermion because uh, because number of fermions is, is supposed to be conserved. But what we can do is you can move a fermion um, from just below the Fermi surface to just above the Fermi surface. Uh, through which you actually create a particle hole pair. So you move the fermion up and you leave a hole behind. Okay, so so um, so that's the particle hole pair. So, so here the energy is minus mu. Uh, and uh, let's say um, if the fermion here has energy uh, uh, minus mu plus omega minus x, and over here this hole is at the energy uh, minus mu minus x, the total particle hole pair uh, would have energy 
uh, Omega. Right. Okay, um, very good. So, um, um, okay, so you can think of the collective excitation as the particle hole pairs. Um, if I write uh, omega for the uh, fermion, Fermi C, or let's say the, is this the Fermi C ground state, um, and uh, uh, for now, uh, for the moment, I'm going to pretend that the other side of the potential doesn't exist. We're going to come back to that. But for now, let's just talk about one side of the potential. Of course, you know, quantum mechanically, you cannot ignore the other side. There's going to be tunneling effects. But those effects are going to be uh, non-perturbably suppressed if mu is large. We're going to return to the question of the non-perturbative effects. Uh, for now, let's ignore, ignore the other side. Um, so um, we have, um, uh, let's say, um, uh, fermion uh, creation of the national operator B, some energy, and B dagger as some energy. Um, and the fermion ground state is such that uh, B uh, annihilates this for uh, E greater than minus mu, and B dagger annihilates this for uh, E less than minus mu. Right, that's what we mean. It's sign here. That's what we mean by filling up to the energy level mu, uh, minus mu. Um, OK, and um, uh, now uh, the collective mode can be thought of as, uh, uh, well, as I said, particle hole pairs. Uh, you can write the uh, creation or election operators of these collective modes um, for the asymptotic states uh, as some combination of B and B dagger. Um, OK, so for example, you can think of the uh, states with uh, N collective field excitation carrying uh, quanta, carrying energy on omega 1 through omega n uh, as uh, uh, something uh, like integral of minus infinity to infinity um, product over dxi, mu b of minus mu minus xi, uh, b dagger minus mu plus omega i minus xi, uh, then acting on omega. Uh, in fact, um, interestingly, uh, so. Uh, you know, there's, uh, even though I said, you know, schematic is part of your whole uh, pairs are the classic excitations, um, it's not immediately obvious. Um, it's, it's precisely this combination that, that you know, with, with a flat measure in, in X uh, that give you the correct um, uh, creation operator for the, for the bosons, but that's something you can actually verify. So, uh, so in fact, um, let me write A omega dagger to be uh, into a DX, from minus infinity to infinity, um, b minus mu minus x, b dagger minus mu plus omega minus x, um, and uh, you can you can check that. Uh, and likewise for a omega, it's a conjugate of this. Uh, you can check that they obey. Uh, so these are they, they in fact obey um, creation uh, and uh, annihilation. Uh, Operators, they obey the combination relations uh, for um, for the uh, uh, for uh, bosons. Um, this calculation is actually a bit um, slightly subtle. If you actually do this calculation, which I recommend that you do, it's an interesting exercise. Um, you'll find that naively, uh, if you just compute the commutators uh, using the combination relation of b and b dagger you'll find that the result is infinity minus infinity, formally, uh, which is ambiguous. Uh, it's important that the acts on the Fermi C were half of the, you know, or, or excitations on which uh, sort of, uh, most of the energy below minus mu are already fixed, uh, already filled, and all the, most of the energy levels above minus mu are empty. Uh, and then uh, that would uh, lead to a finite answer. And uh, you'll you, you see that uh, they obey uh, the competition relations such that A omega with a omega prime dagger is actually um, omega delta uh, omega minus omega prime. So this is something that you can you can check. Um, so okay. Um, now, uh, uh, so the fermions are not interacting. Um, but there's a non-trivial reflection phase. 
that's energy dependent. Uh, and that will lead to, in fact, non-trivial interaction effectively for these bosons. Um, to draw a picture, uh, here's, uh, so, um, you know, in fact, um, uh, uh, strictly speaking, I should, uh, uh, you know, write this kind of bosonization relation independently for incoming states, the in states and the out states, asymptotic states. Um, so there's a set of relation like this for the in states and set of relation like this for the out states. Um, the in and out fermion oscillators, uh, Christian and Lashian operators, are related by some reflex reflection phase, um, but the relation among the A's uh, will be not so simple. So in fact, if you look at the overlap between in and out boson states, you'll find some non-trivial S matrix. Um, there's, a, there's a nice formula for, uh, for this. Uh, let me first write the formula and explain uh, where it comes from. Um, so, uh, uh, the idea is that, uh, so, okay, so let's uh, draw a picture like this. So there's some, this potential acts like a wall that bounces the fermion back. Um, so each boson is a pair of uh, uh, particle and hole. Um, so let's say, um, uh, let's say here's the particle. It kind of bounces off the wall. Uh, the hole which is like a particle that travels backward in time, also bounces off the wall. Okay, so here's the hole, and uh, this blue line represents the particle. Uh, so this is an example of one to one amplitude uh, for the boson. Uh, you can have, uh, uh, you can have, uh, so here's another example uh, of, uh, uh, let's say, a one to two process. For example, you can have uh, two bosons coming out. Um, and here, uh, what can happen is that you have some particle and, uh, and then you have this hole bouncing uh, through a process like this. Um, so this is some general formula uh, oops, uh, that uh, this is due to uh, uh, Moore, Plesser, and Ramgulam, this is 91. Um, they found a general formula for the amplitudes of the bosons, uh, which can be written as some of these bounces, um, some of these bounces, uh, with some sign due to the fermion statistics, integral dx, which is a parameter that parameterizes how the energy is distributed between the particle and the host um, in, in this loop, um, and some uh, products or these bounces of some reflection amplitudes of the particle and the reflection amplitude of the hole. Um, so, uh, you know, for example, um, the one-to-one uh, uh, -one amplitude is just integral dx uh, zero to omega, the particle energy minus mu plus omega minus x, and the whole reflection amplitude minus mu minus x. Um, and um, uh, the one-to-two amplitude uh, is uh, given by, well, this, this one is a little bit more subtle, so I'm not gonna derive in detail. It's of a similar form, but uh, um, you also have the same integrand, uh, but um, it turns out the integration range is, uh, should be, is the following, zero to omega one uh, plus zero to omega two uh, minus zero to omega. Okay, so, so what I, by which I mean the integration over the first interval, the second interval, subtracted by the integration of the third interval. So there's some formula like this. I'm not gonna derive this in, in its entire detail. Um, but intuitively, at least I hope it makes sense. So, uh, so what are uh, this particle and the whole reflection amplitudes? Um, well, uh, this, is just, this is just the uh, um, uh, you know, reflection amplitude of uh, fermion uh, in this uh, non-relativistic quantum mechanical system of this inverted harmonic potential. Uh, we can write an uh, exact answer uh, momentarily. Uh, the conceptually more important or more puzzling thing is, uh, or a slightly more confusing thing is what is the reflection amplitude of the whole? So this requires um, a bit of an explanation. 
Um, so, uh, in fact, uh, up to now, I have pretended that the other side of the potential didn't exist. So if the potential looked like this, with the uh, fill up to you know, energy minus mu, uh, then the formula I wrote earlier would, uh, would um, uh, apply exactly. In that case, I will write this boson creation operator to be, to be this. Um, I think that's the same as what I wrote earlier. Yeah, anyway. Um, um, and um, uh, the, you know, there's no ambiguity of what uh, B and B dagger mean for the in and out state. Um, um, and uh, the, ref the reflection amplitude uh, of the particle, um, well, in this case, uh, you know, the reflection amplitude of the particle is going to be a phase. And uh, the reflection amplitude of the whole will just turn out to be. Uh, you know, converting B to B dagger is going to be um, a fraction part into the particle uh, star. Uh, that's going to go into the formula of the uh, of uh, more plus and Ram Coulomb. Um, so, um, well, you, you know, it's up to now. It's not obvious that uh, you know uh, what exactly is the non-perturbative form of the potential of the matrix model due to the C plus one string theory, uh, based on what I've told you so far. Um, but if you want to take the simplest form of the potential, which is inverted uh, harmonic potential, this is the simplest Hamiltonian you can write down, uh, it does have two sides. So, um, you know, so there's a question of what do you want to do on the other side, if you want to make sense of the system uh, non-perturbatively. In fact, uh, it was thought for uh, many years that this model is just not supposed to make sense non perturbatively But surprisingly, due to you know, recent work on the Dean-Sentan effects, uh, as I'll explain to you uh, mostly in the next lecture, um, it is possible to make sense this matrix model, not only non perturbatively but in some miraculous way, it actually agrees with uh, amplitude, uh, sort of non perturbative effects on the string scatter amplitudes in C equals one string theory. Um, so, um, so in order to make sense of this, I have to uh, you know, look at this uh, tunneling effects more carefully. Um, so in particular, uh, first, so first of all, I should specify uh, what are the fermion energy levels uh, at the quantum level. Uh, so at a given energy level, um, for the for, uh, individual fermion, uh, there are two independent uh, energy eigenstates, uh, which are scattering states. Uh, so uh, so one of them, uh, you can work in with a basis in which uh, one of them corresponds to fermion wave function that comes in from the right side, bounce back, and then there's some tunneling to the left. So the amplitude, schematically, I'll write this incoming amplitude as one. There's a tunneling amplitude T, transmission, and reflection amplitude R. Uh, this state, I'm going to call it denoted by in state for the individual fermion coming from the right. There is a orthogonal state, which you can call in state left, where the fermion coming from the left bounce back and also have some amplitude of tunneling to the right. Okay, so this is the in basis for the uh, fermion at a given energy. There's an out basis, similarly, with the fermion coming in from the left and bounce back and from, also from the right, and only uh, for the outcoming fermion only goes to the right. There's nothing, there's no flux to the left. So this I'll call it out. R. Um, and then likewise, there's another one uh, that looks like this. Um, uh, so this I call out L. Okay, so uh, the in L and in R are orthogonal states. Out R and out L are orthogonal states. And there's a transformation relating in and out. So uh, in particular, in right, let's say at energy E, is just, you know, this is just S matrix in quantum mechanics. Some reflection amplitude depends on the energy, and some transmission amplitude depends on the energy. Out uh, R. Uh, sorry, this is out L. Okay. Uh, all right. Um, so now um, uh, there are two uh, kind of uh, uh, natural kind of ground states you can consider. In fact, naively, there's only one kind of natural ground state you can consider. Uh, which is uh, if you fill up both sides of this potential with fermions. Um, it will turn out that this is not quite uh, the correct uh, matrix model due to C equals one string theory. 
as I'll explain uh, in the next lecture. Uh, for now, I'll just say that it, it's uh, not, not only that it has more excitations because it has left and right and so on and so forth, it'll be due to a different kind of string theory. This is so, so called, uh, I'll call this the type 0b uh, matrix quantum mechanics. I will not explain the terminology yet. Uh, I'll just say that here's there's one thing you can do on the matrix model side, um, but it's not going to be the one of interest at the moment. Uh, nonetheless, for this model, uh, you have the omega defined in a similar way um, and for the ground state, well, uh, uh, as in this indicated in this picture. Um, and you can write the boson, let's say, um, this will be the boson, let's say, coming from the right, the in state, uh, in terms of the fermion particle pair as um, B in right, this is energy minus mu plus omega minus x. And importantly, for the for the hole, you the, the hole is for me I'm moving backwards. So incoming hole is the outgoing particle being annihilated. Okay, so that's that's the slightly tricky thing here. So B out right minus mu minus x. Uh, so this uh, you know if you uh, study the uh, uh, transformation going from in to out, um, where in and out get switched, you'll find that the reflection amplitude of the hole is uh, again the complex conjugate of the reflection amplitude of the particle. But importantly now, because there's some small tunneling effect, uh, our particle amplitude is less than one and our whole amplitude uh, absolute value is also less than one. Okay, uh, but uh, as, as I said, this is actually not the model I'm going to claim to be the dual to sequence one string theory. The one that's gonna be of interest um, uh, is uh, what I call the sequence one matrix quantum mechanics. Um, here, we're, we're gonna only fill the right side. So, so we feel all the energy levels that correspond to these uh, in right states and they can tunnel to the left, but there's no flux coming in from the left. Okay, so in other words, um, this ground state, I'll call this omega C equals one, uh, is defining property is such that, so only these in right energy E states are filled for uh, E less than minus mu. Um, equivalently, I can say that um, B in right dagger E on this analysis of the ground state for E less than equal to minus mu, uh, but E B in left, these are unoccupied. So the annihilation operator will annihilate this for E less than equal to minus mu. That's the defining property of the ground state. Okay, that's the definition. Um, so then uh, it turns out you can uh, do a similar calculation and verify that the correct boson, the correct uh, combination of particle hole that obeys the boson commutation, commutation relation uh, is a slightly modified formula from the one I wrote above. It's uh, turned out to be, um, so you still have a B out, right? So which looks like an incoming uh, hole creation operator, B in right, dagger minus mu plus omega minus x, uh, but you have to correct for this by um, r minus mu minus x inverse. Um, the reason for this, one way to understand this is that if you actually use the, my definition of this round state and calculate the a, a dagger commutator, you'll find that, um, so you have to convert this b out into b in to compute the correct commutation relation. Uh, and that brings the extra factor of r, which cancels against this r inverse. Um, so I invite you to, to, to check that, but this is the one I claim that obeys the standard boson competition relation. Um, and for this, um, uh, if you uh, calculate the overlap between the in and out uh, boson states, you'll find um, that uh, in order to apply the NPR formula, the uh, particle, uh, the whole uh, reflection, uh, so this, this r is just that of the particle, the same as rp. So the whole reflection uh, amplitude will be uh, the particle refraction amplitude inverse. Okay, so this is a funny conclusion here. So that's kind of amusing. This is, this is kind of amusing formula because I told you that due to tunneling, RP, the particle reflection amplitude is slightly less than one. Therefore, the, our whole, the whole reflection amplitude is slightly bigger than one. And that's a bit uh, counterintuitive uh, because how can the reflection amplitude of some object to have a magnitude that's bigger than one? Well, the whole is not a real object. Okay, so it's not an actual contradiction. Um, and it will turn out, uh, as we'll see in examples, 
maybe not ex very explicitly, but anyway, it'll turn out that um, um, the boson amplitude will not exceed unitarity bound, despite that the hole has a bigger reflection amplitude uh, than, 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 than one. Um, okay, anyway, so the key is that for the theory of interest for the moment, this equals one, matrix quantum mechanics are defining this way with this specific ground state, uh, we have the relation of the part, the, the whole reflection amplitude is the inverse of the particle reflection amplitude. This will be the key. Uh, this discussion won't actually matter at the perturbative level, in fact. I, the reason I bother with this detailed discussion is because the next lecture I'm gonna generalize this, uh, I'm gonna discuss the non-perturbative aspects of it. Um, but for now, let me comment on um, um, uh, comment on what this uh, I'll say what this RP is. Okay, so let's look at the fermion uh, reflection amplitude. This RP of E. Uh, so this is simply a, a good old non-relativistic quantum mechanical system of the Schrodinger problem. And uh, we all know how to solve this. Um, but anyway. Uh, here, we're only interested in the uh, asymptotics. So let's say uh, x goes infinity, the asymptotic form the wave function will look like e to the plus minus i x squared over two plus uh, plus minus i e and half uh, log of x. I'll, I'll put the factor of square root minus mu here for convention. Um, so uh, recall that uh, we're gonna later define uh, x as a uh, square root of two mu cosh of tau and tau is the more natural coordinates and this log of x asymptotically just becomes uh, tau basically. Okay, so this looks like a plane wave because as you remember the collective field asymptotically um, behave like a relativistic massless particle. So we're going to try to use the same coordinate uh, tau to we can use the same coordinate tau to parameterize the fermions as well. It, it doesn't matter just for, just for, uh, just for uh, convenience. Um, okay, uh, so here um, this uh, uh, plus uh, corresponds to going out and the minus corresponds to going in, incoming wave and outgoing wave. Okay, and uh, of course, uh, if you then demand that there's no incoming flux from the left, uh, then you will relate to the outgoing wave from the incoming wave. So you have one here and the reflection into the R here. So this R can be calculated. Um, I, won't, um, uh, I won't do this in detail, uh, but this is a standard uh, solvable uh, system. So there's some uh, phase factor due to my convention. This is a, just a matter of convention for labeling my coordinates. Um, and then the non-trivial part is square root of uh, some formula like this, one plus e to the two pi e gamma function, one half minus i e um, over gamma one half plus i e. Okay, it's just some formula, but uh, it's actually a very interesting formula. So I'd like to uh, stare at this for a moment. Um, so the first thing to observe is that, uh, you know, uh, as a, remember G effective coupling is one over mu. So perturbatively, uh, so if I look at weak coupling, the mu is very large. Um, e is supposed to go like minus mu plus X where X is something energy of the excitation as order one. So I'll, I'll talk about excitations of order one amount uh, from the Fermi surface. Okay, so um, in particular, you see that this um, one e to the two pi e, uh, this e to, e to two pi e is going to be suppressed by e to the minus mu, which is e to the minus one over coupling. So this is non-perturbative correction. Non-perturbative correction. All right. Uh, on the other hand, this term, it turns out this one, I will call this perturbative, in the sense that this term is going to be recovered by the Borel summation of the perturb perturbation series. Uh, so let me explain why this is true. Actually, before I explain that, um, uh, let me comment on the analytic structure of this, which is also interesting. Um, so uh, let me defer this discussion of this perturbative part for the moment. Uh, you may wonder, what if this non-perturbative term, this non-perturbative factor isn't there? Um, could that be, could, could, could we have another model where, you know, there's no number perturbative uh, part uh, in this formula. Um, now, by the way, I should remind you, of course, that this R is not the full amplitude. You have to plug this into this integration formula over the balances and, and to, to get the actual boson amplitude. Anyway, 
Um, but it doesn't change the fact that this, this correction, this one over one plus e to the two pi e is going to give rise to some kind of number derivative correction. So uh, if you look at the, uh, if you end continue this amplitude to the, to the entire complex plane on the complex, this is the complex energy plane, um, then, so, okay, so here's the real axis. You can, you can see that in fact, we've got uh, poles uh, down here at, uh, you know, uh, minus i over two, minus three i over two, etc. So we have uh, poles. Um, and uh, um, uh, in the upper half plane, uh, actually, uh, what would have been uh, might have been poles from the uh, uh, this uh, number derivative term gets cancelled by zeros from the gamma function. Oh, actually, uh, well, you see, um, so, so th there's there's no there are no poles or or zeros uh, up there actually. So let me erase this. Not so that I won't confuse you. Uh, so I'll just say that uh, uh, no pose here. Okay. Um, if you drop this number interpretive part, the pose will have turned into branch cuts, square root branch cuts. And that would be bad because uh, that cannot happen for the S matrix of a non relative physical quantum mechanics. So this is the expected uh, pole structure. Uh, for uh, non restive quantum mechanics uh, S matrix or amplitude, let me just call it amplitude. That has poles on the lower half plane, which is required by causality. Um, okay. Uh, and, uh, and this number of parts, uh, which is, you know, you write some number of effects in the, in the collision field amplitudes uh, is actually essential for this pole structure. Okay. Um, so, so now let me, uh, ooh, uh, okay, so um, yeah, uh, now let me discuss this um, uh, perturbative part. So um, earlier I wrote down some formula, this is due to uh, Moore, Plesser, and Rangulam about, uh, you know, this uh, one to one amplitude and one to two amplitudes. Uh, these, I, I emphasize, are exact formula in the proposed matrix model. Uh, so you can just take the, this gamma function square root formula plug into these integrals and just expand in one over mu. You'll find a all other expansion in one over mu uh, and you'll find non perturbative corrections on top of that. Um, so let me discuss this perturbative uh, corrections uh, uh, for a bit. Uh, so um, uh, the perturbative expansion uh, in uh, one over mu, which is the coupling is a asymptotic expansion. It has a zero radius of convergence as all, all often happen in perturbation theory. Um, but it turns out to be, uh, but uh, turns out to be Borel summable. So what does that mean? Uh, well, if you have a function, let's say f of g, uh, it has an asymptotic uh, Taylor expansion like so. so. Let's say this is asymptotic. When we say it's Borel summable, what it means is that um, there's going to be a Borel transform B of t, which is defined to be sum over the same coefficient a n t to the n over n factorial. Um, so, so if so, if this if this uh, converges converges and uh, can be analytically uh, continued to the uh, strip, and let me draw a picture. So here's the complex T plane, and uh, here's a strip of interest in, into the, the strip over here. Um, uh, then uh, uh, <clears throat> we can perform an inverse Borel transform, then the inverse Borel transform uh, is given by uh, one over G um, integral e to the minus T over G B of T DT. Um, so uh, in nice situation, if the function is Borel summable, it means that this thing will give you back uh, F of G. So this is Borel summability. Some of them. 
Um, so uh, in a sense, the broad summability is a natural way to define what we mean by summing up the perturbative series when the perturbative series is only asymptotic series. It may not be possible if you have some singularity in this strip, in this blue uh, strip, okay? Um, it will turn out to be the case here. Um, and you know, there's something that you know, in principle, okay, you can try to expand these amplitudes, uh, do a Taylor expansion and, and see, but you know, it, it's, uh, it's fairly complicated to check this. Uh, luckily, um, uh, there's a mathematician uh, named Nevelina in the uh, early 20th century, 1918 to be precise, um, who discovered a theory, who proved a theorem that help us to easily check whether the function is broad summable or not. So um, Nevelina's theorem, uh, this 1918. I should confess that I've never looked at the original paper, but I only look at the paper that cited the paper by, by Navalina, uh, which is you can actually find uh, online. Um, so this function f of g, uh, if this function is analytic on the open domain, a real part of one over g is bigger than one over epsilon for some constant epsilon greater than zero. So let me draw a picture of what's, what's this domain. So here's the complex coupling plane, G plane. Here's the origin. Um, and uh, let's say this is, uh, here is a vertical line across this epsilon. Uh, then the domain of interest is this disk that's over here, so over here, that's this domain. Okay, so uh, first, if the function is ending in this domain, uh, and if uh, fg minus its uh, Taylor series in g truncated to order n uh, is bounded by some constant c times n factorial times some number sigma to n power times the coupling itself, absolute value to n uh, for uh, some constant c and the sigma that are positive and uniformly in n for n large, sufficiently large, uh, then f of g is equal to its Borel resummation as defined earlier. That is, its Borel transform will have uh, an continuation to this blue strip and f will be equal to the inverse transform. Um, so um, you see this G, this is one over G, so what they call mu. Uh, so this condition is actually not so hard to check. So it turns out for this uh, uh, gamma function is actually more precisely log gamma function using uh, integral representation of uh, log of gamma is easy to check that log of gamma of mu is borrow summable viewed as an expansion in one over mu. Um, so, so that's why, and that's why I say that this stuff is borrow summable, in fact, uh, if you change the shift the variable e by a little bit and then you know plug into these integrals, it does not change this this property. You can easily check check that the condition for uh, the assumption for Navalina's theorem will be satisfied. Okay, uh, so to summarize, uh, you know this purple part, this perturbative part of the contribution um, to the MFP, NPR formula uh, for the collective field amplitude. Uh, is going to be equal to uh, its borrower summation. But then on top of that, there are additional non-perturbative corrections given by this blue part. Um, okay, um, so uh, let me uh, summarize. summarize. Uh, so we have defined what's called the C equals one matrix quantum mechanics, uh, where we fill out the right side of Fermi C by defining what I mean by filling the right side of Fermi C earlier in a precise way. This makes sense non-perturbatively. Um, so the exact S matrix um, of uh, collective excitations um, is computed by uh, more pleasure regulums uh, sum over bounds formula that I sketched. Um, okay, so. Um, uh, this is believed to be due to single string theory. That, in particular, means that perturbatively, 
perturbatively, uh, it's believed to, uh, well, it's supposed to, to, to agree with uh, that of sequence one string theory. Um, and I showed you last time that, uh, well, at least for the tree level, three point amplitude, so this is zero labeled tree level, uh, uh, this at least agree. At the, you know, uh, <clears throat> um, but beyond this, uh, well, you know, it's not so easy to calculate amplitude of sequence one string theory. Uh, but it's very easy to calculate from the matrix model using the formula. Just plug into Mathematica, expand the one over mu, you just produce, you know, order by order answers that they all look like polynomials in mu, uh, in, in omegas for the perturbative part. The numbering part will not look like poly polynomial. I'll discuss that next time. Um, so perturbative part, they're all polynomial expressions. And these are checked uh, in our uh, 2017 paper, uh, checked numerically uh, for uh, the Three level four point amplitude and the uh, one loop two point amplitude that which I sketched last time. So these both seem to agree numerically, which give us uh, quite a lot of confidence that the duality actually holds, um, which really wasn't uh, obvious. Um, so uh, one, uh, so you know, it's believed that it's to, it agrees to all order, but uh, I'm not aware of a robust argument. Um, uh, uh, that 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 you know that would be true, um, but this one loop check of the one to one amplitude is already extremely non-trivial uh, evidence uh, for it. In fact, you you could wonder whether this claim that mu is uh, one over mu is two pi uh, g string. You, you may wonder um, uh, whether this could have some you know higher order corrections to this formula. Uh, this is actually not going to be sensitive to the check at the tree level four point uh, or any tree level amplitude actually, uh, and that the also not evident at this level. You have to, I think, you have to first go to the first place where you, you might see whether there's a correction to this relation will be from the one loop uh, three point amplitude, which nobody has computed. So you know, if you are a, a graduate student looking for uh, some hard calculation to, to do, um, you know, this is something that and you know. It was very tough to do, but well defined. This is something that you can you, you can try. But uh, um, at least at the time we wrote the paper, it was too hard for us, so I haven't done this. Um, okay, so um, uh, there are non-perturbative corrections on top of this. Okay, so I, I should say the status of this is that it has only been checked up to this level, but uh, you know we believe that it, you know, perturbatively the correspondence is true to all order. Uh, which is actually kind of remarkable because uh, these are you know not trivial expressions. They're very simple expressions as function of energy, but they're very non-trivial. And in string theory, we hardly ever do uh, explicit computations beyond genus one. It's usually prohibitively difficult. Uh, but in this model, it might just be possible. Um, but still, you have to do very hard work to integrate uh, conformal blocks. Um, I mean, unless you there's some amazing uh, trick that's yet to be discovered, the numerical computation of this integrals uh, over the moduli space to remain surfaces with punctures would be uh, quite tough, although also very interesting. Anyway, uh, non-perturbatively, uh, so this will be the next time, uh, we'll see that uh, the number of corrections of the matrix model can be matched to with the d instanton effects in, string, in the sequence one string theory. Um, uh, in fact, uh, Ashok Sen's lecture has already alluded to, to this, uh, some discussion of this. Um, I will discuss the uh, uh, Related close related computation from a different perspective, um, kind of complementary to his to his lectures, um, and um, so that's um, you know as far as the the correspondence at level of S matrix, there are other interesting uh, physical observables you can study. For example, you can study the system at finite temperature. Um, so uh, we'll probably return to, so so we'll discuss um, uh, discuss maybe uh, in the in fourth lecture. Um, so uh, I guess I'm out of time now, so I will uh, stop here for today. Uh, thanks, C, for a very nice lecture. And any questions for C? So I have a question. Um, so um, in the BFSS matrix model, the 
the a, a single um, eigenvalue corresponds to a, a D zero brand. Is there uh, anything similar here? Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, I guess that was asked earlier. Um, mm, yeah, that, uh, that was me. <laughs> uh, uh, yes, yes, uh, indeed. Um, so uh, uh, it, it is thought uh, to be the case that um, a, a single eigenvalue or a single fermion uh, by itself is in a sense dual to um, a ZZ brain, which I'll introduce next lecture in the sequence one string theory. Um, but uh, I should, um, uh, uh, this is a very interesting statement. I should say that this statement actually, so th this I guess was uh, 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 first proposed by uh, McGreevy and Verlinde uh, around 2002 or something. Um, uh, it, it's, it's a statement that's, uh, um, that's often taken for granted, but I should say that it's not, um, no, I, well, I should say that it's almost certainly correct, uh, but it's a more non-trivial than often what people make it out to be. Um, so, so, so what's going on here? Uh, the claim is that if you take a fermion and bring it to the top of the potential, um, then it's supposed to look like um, uh, this, uh, you know, this uh, ZZ brain. Now this guy is, uh, looks like it's not stable, wants to roll down the potential one way or the other. Um, so um, uh, the Dewey freedom that uh, moves this eigenvalue and left and right of the top, from the top of poten potential uh, is uh, identified with the, so, so this is a ZZ brain, uh, is identified with the open string tachyon Dewey freedom on the ZZ brain. So the ZZ brain is unstable, has open string tachyon. Uh, and turning on the vec for the tachyon corresponds to moving this, this guy, okay? Now, um, to a leading order, you know, in perturbation theory, you know, you know the tachyon has a negative mass squared, so that's, can, you can imagine that it agrees with this instability of the eigenvalue at the top, at the top of the potential, uh, but uh, it's a big question, you know, what happens when you include nonlinear effects? Um, you see, um, it's uh, sometimes, Asserted that uh, that you know the way to derive quote unquote derive this matrix model is by imagining that uh, the sequence one string theory is kind of the vacuum is created by condensing a large number of ZZ brains. Um, this is a nice picture, but I'm not sure to what extent it is justified or even correct, um, because um, you know the dynamics of open string tachyon is certainly not the same as the single fermion just probing this inverted harmonic potential. Um, because we know that there are, you know, for example, cubic interactions open, there's a non-trivial open string field theory for this tachyon, right? In fact, uh, uh, the story of open string tachyon condensation in bosonic string theory, originally conjectured by Sen and proved by Martin Schnabel, actually applies exactly to, to this theory. Uh, so Schnabel's solution for open string tachyon condensation, which was originally uh, phrased in critical bosonic string theory uh, applies identically uh, to the system. So uh, when the opening tachyon time condenses, at least on the, on the right side, you just go back to the closed string vacuum where the, uh, the brain disappears. But in particular, that also means that the effective potential for the tachyon, you know, let's say some tachyon field, the effective potential looks like this. Okay, so, uh, it, you know, it kind of looks like, you know, maybe this eigenvalue the effective potential of the eigenvalue fields if the right part of the Fermi C is filled. So then you have a potential that looks just like the tachyon potential that you might expect. Um, but that uh, is far from established. Uh, but which I mean, you know, we understand that what happens when tachyon condenses, but to show that the potential has the same shape and the actually the dynamics matches on with that of a single uh, eigenvalue in the presence of all the other eigenvalues filling the Fermi C, um, that as far as I know has not been established. Uh, and that's actually a very interesting problem uh, in um, open string field theory that I think is worth uh, exploring further. Hmm. And also, uh, is it possible to define some uh, scattering state of the, the ZZ brain and such that you can directly compute the refraction matrix by um, from string theory side? Um, uh, that's a very good question. Uh, 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 you know, I have not, uh, you know, we thought a little bit about this, but I haven't really thought seriously about such a computation. Uh, 
it's uh, mm, I think it should be possible, but it kind of requires um, well, okay, I shouldn't say that uh, I know that it's possible because it requires some kind of non-perturbative understanding of the open stream field theory. You see, uh, 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 the way the Ashokson has formulated the stream field theory, open or closed, uh, is um, perturbative by, by, by nature. But it just happens that open stream field theory, you know, when you write it using um, Witten's um, coordinate system, uh, just happens to be to be to be exact, uh, you know, for the bosonic uh, cubic theory, um, and at the uh, classical level, it makes sense to speak of non-perturbative solutions. But it's not obvious to me how to make sense of that. How to define the, 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 that open stream field theory at the quantum level? So, um, yeah, because of that, it's not obvious to me that uh, one. You know, the, this framework allows you to actually formulate the computation directly in the string, string field theory framework to form the computation of the reflection amplitude of or tunneling amplitude uh, of the Z brain. Uh, it would be nice to, to understand that. Any more questions for C? Oh, there's a question of where did I use the double scaling limit? That was at the very beginning. So, uh, uh, well, uh, uh, let's see, where is it? Okay, so uh, you see, in order for n to be finite, uh, I will have to take the potential to be bounded. But I'm gonna take n to infinity and remove this bounded part of the potential simultaneously. Uh, that's a double scaling limit. So the point is to, to keep the Fermi level minus mu to be fixed. So I have implicitly already used that. Uh, I should emphasize also that uh, should be clear by now that n is not a parameter. n is strictly infinite. So this is a little bit different from the usual ADS CFT where the string coupling is related to one over n. In this case, one over n is just zero. There is no one over n. Okay, so we're actually expanding in one over mu. But in another sense, it's actually very similar to one over n expansion because um, one over because mu is proportional to eigenvalue density. So uh, so one of the new expansion is kind of like one of the random expansion, but you know, here the actual n is infinite. I have a question to follow up on, on this. So you said that we can regularize this potential by adding the x pop term with some uh, coupling alpha. And yes. uh, when you take the n to infinity limit and you want to in the same time, the alpha to zero. Do you fix right. some ratio between n and alpha? Oh uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Some combination. You calculate that by calculating the volume of that blob. I guess I drew it somewhere. Uh, oh, I see. You know, yeah, you just calculate the volume of the blob. That that's it. I see. If, oh, if then, you, then, you then that would be for most purpose, we don't really care about this. Yeah. I see. Okay. Thanks. 